So we're going to open this up to questions and answers now, and I'm going to exploit my position as the chair to ask the first question. Um, I just have a question about, you know, you hear a lot about the how NATO is obsolete, but you also hear maybe more valid um, arguments that, although it might not be obsolete, the North Atlantic Treaty is a little bit anachronistic in the sense that it was written in 1949 when the big threat was other states, and now you have the non-state actor threat. And the idea of an armed attack could be anybody. It could be a, an individual in, in, in Paris and London. And, and the only time that Article 5 has really been invoked was after 9-11, and that wasn't accepted by the United States. And there was talk about it being invoked after Paris, but they decided it wasn't relevant because non-state actors can't be targeted. They don't have a home address in the same way. And that also matters for the difference between military spending, because although um, non-state actors can be a military threat to the United States, they're a law enforcement problem in Europe. And that changes the budgeting aspect. Okay, Europol is also spending money. Does that count towards protection? Because these are people who are homegrown. So I'd like you to talk about the changes that non-state actors have and non-state terrorists have on those kind of dimensions and on the North Atlantic Alliance and on arguments over budgets and spending and military versus law enforcement. First point is that even though terrorists are individual and small groups, states still matter because those terrorists have to be physically someplace, which means they're residing in a state. Um, they have to get money through something, and therefore they're going through institutions over which states have control. So you can't, you can't write states out of the equation. These are not free-floating actors like aliens who come down and visit horror upon us and then disappear again. So states are still part of the equation. I think where your question is, is especially germane is the intersection of internal and external security. So the handy-dandy division that you know, NATO did the outside and police forces did the inside, that no longer pertains, because there's too much crossover. I mean, there's a whole big debate in critical security studies about whether the response to 9-11 should have been about the FBI rather than the Department of Defense. So you know, what was the, what, the whole Iraq, Afghanistan, you know, all that came out after 9-11 was precisely the wrong thing. It should have been treated as a judicial issue for police forces rather than militarized and securitized in the way that it was. But nonetheless, you do have that intersection between, between external security and internal security. So NATO still clearly has a role, <coughs> not only because states still matter, but also because, and, and here I take a little bit of issue with, with, the, with, with the way the question was framed, you know, we can sit here in this geopolitical position and say, oh, who's going to invade who? Well, as I said earlier, the Balt Baltic states know exactly who could invade who. And NATO, in fact, has done a bit of a 180 degree turn in the last five to 10 years. Be precisely because of the post-Cold War era, the assumption was, oh, NATO was now sort of sort of a, a European UN with teeth, and we'd go off and, and they'd go off and do things in Afghanistan and do what they said. But now territorial defense is back front and center, and people are buying old-fashioned tanks and old-fashioned jet fighters and old-fashioned submarines because they see a very specific state threat on the horizon. So NATO has that job to do, if it can do it. But you're absolutely right in as much as there are new actors new constellations, and new intersections that have to be pursued. Um, and in a sense, that is a lot of what, what, what Margarini has been talking about in terms of the European security defense strategy, delivering security, not just in the old-fashioned sense of guns and bombs and borders, but also delivering security in terms of migration, in terms of refugees, in terms of police and security, in terms of Europol, in terms of Frontex, in terms of European Coast Guards. There's an entire menu there. That's available, and you can't even begin. You know, just plug cyber in there on top of that, and you know you've got you've got a huge a huge agenda. Um, so I think the short answer is you've got different horses for courses. NATO has a job to do. The EU has a job to do. OSCE has a job to do. And what we need the European Union to do is to get its own act together in terms of the tools at its disposal, and then to work cooperatively with NATO, with OSCE, with <coughs> UN, all the multilateral agencies and bilateral with other governments in order to address what you correctly identify as a much broader security agenda than, than perhaps we're used to. Does anybody else have any questions? I'll open up to the floor. Oh. Uh, I, um, thanks, Ben, for that. I thought it was pretty interesting. I actually have about 50 questions. <laughs> but, um, you can have two. Uh, two <laughs> um, my first one is uh, <coughs> Tesco and battle groups. Yeah. That opens up the dreaded word, which is neutrality in Ireland. I don't like to use the N word, but that's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm wondering, firstly, how, if this should be reopened in Ireland, and secondly, how you would reopen this to the Irish public who naturally are massively against it, from what it seems. The second one is about migration. 
um, extreme right wing politics and kind of in some places the breakdown of politics in Europe. Is migration a new kind of root cause to this, or is this the straw that broke the camel's back after a long issues after the last 15 years? I mean, in terms of globalization and yeah. pressures. Is migration the thing that is this the, the main problem, or is this just the last problem that has the straw that the camel's back? Okay. That, okay. that snap people. Okay, um, neutrality first. Um, well, it's, it's never not open, it's always there, even if you don't talk about it. Um, and I think there are two important things to say, first of all. First of all, much of the debate in this country about neutrality is, is and I don't mean this in any way to be offensive, but it, it's a dialogue of the deaf. I mean, you have people talking about something, the definition of which they bitterly disagree on. So for Irish government, neutrality simply means we're not members of NATO, and we will not join a European security alliance, European defense alliance. That's all it is. Everything up to that point is fair game. So there's nothing in the agenda that I outlined earlier that an Irish government could not do and put its hand on its heart and say this is entirely consistent with our traditional military neutrality. Now, the problem for the government is that not many other people accept that as a definition of neutrality. Um, you know, the People's Republic of China is neutral, but I wouldn't set them up as an ethical example of international behavior. Those who talk about neutrality are very often not talking about neutrality, but all of the values that they ascribe to neutrality. So neutrality for many people is about being the good guy. Neutrality is about being anti-imperialist. Neutrality is about being pro-development. Neutrality is about being pro-sustainable development. Neutrality is being about anti-nuclear. But none of those things, with the possible exception of the nuclear, but we could come back to that, none of those things require you to be neutral. Um, if I want to say things that you know, piss off uh, friends and colleagues in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, um, I very often like to say, you know, I will take the foreign policy of Norway, Canada, Denmark, maybe even the Dutch from time to time, but it depends, um, you know, in terms of an ethical scorecard, and set it up against Irish foreign policy any day of the week. And they're full on NATO members. And I will take a neutral country, I mean a properly neutral country, the one that's really not <coughs> an example neutral country, Switzerland, and I will talk about their ethics down here in terms of what the Swiss actually do that is normatively ethical as opposed to what is, happens to be good for Swiss business. So don't tell me that neutrality equates with goodness, because it doesn't. But the counter argument, and I always make this, you know, for 800 years, this country suffered from its geopolitical position. It was crucified on the basis of its geopolitical position for 800 years. The last 50, we've been able to make hay in the sunshine because all the trouble is way far away. I think it's a big ask to say to the Irish people, you know what, take all these burdens onto yourself and contribute to the security and defense of faraway lands and faraway peoples. Now, I would make the argument that's a very unethical argument to make. But a former teacher made that very argument with respect to Greece and Turkey. Bertie Hearn at some point was asked about Irish neutrality. Well, why would we come to the aid of Greece or Turkey? Okay, you're members of the European Union, but that's cool. But that's, if that's the attitude you want to take, that's the attitude you can take. So what I come down to is basically this. Any decision the government makes on engagement in the agenda that I outlined, or even more if the prospect of, and it's not an immediate prospect, of an actual common European defense was laid on the table, you know, that is for an Irish government to sit down, do a hard-nosed cost-benefit analysis and say, right, should we be in or can we stay out? And what is the balance of interests with respect to that? And then they have to have a conversation with the Irish people. I would rather they have a conversation with the Irish people in advance of that, but no Irish politician is willing to do it. No substantial Irish politician is willing to do it. We had an individual in this house, I was sitting right there where you are now, and <coughs> I'm not giving any way by saying the gender, but he was standing right there. And I said, you know, in the context of the thing he was talking about, um, you know, why wouldn't you at least have a conversation about neutrality? And his response, fair dues, perfectly honest, was, I don't kick sleeping dogs. Now, that's not my definition of political leadership, but nonetheless, for a rational politician, that's a pretty fair, safe, and honest answer. On your migration question, that's really tough. First of all, <coughs> Migration is not a problem. It's the sources of the migration that's the problem. The problem with migration is the civil war in Syria. The problem with migration is the poverty in North Africa. The problem with migration is the lack of water in North Africa and the lack of opportunity, the lack of democracy, and the lack of human rights in lots of places. 
That's the problem of migration. If you're talking about dealing with the outflows of those problems, which we could address if we choose to, um, in dealing with those problems, then yes, that puts social systems and political systems under pressure. But compare and contrast Germany and the United Kingdom. Look at the scale of migration that Germany has handled. And compare that, for example, to the UK. I mean, I was at a thing, again, because it's being recorded and broadcast, I was at a thing where I met a man. Um, <laughs> and um, he, was, he was, like most of you in this room, you know, happy, clappy, Western, uh, proto-liberal, cosmopolitan, you know, card-carrying member of the British Labour Party. Um, and he voted for Brexit. And the reason he explained he voted for Brexit was because his neighbours in the place, the working class place in the north of England where he lived, um, you know, they had been done down by all these Romanians and Poles. And they couldn't get jobs because the Romanians and Poles were taking the jobs because the Romanians and Poles were willing to work for the salaries that were on offer. And they were getting, and there was pressure on housing, and there was pressure on the National Health Service, and there was pressure on all these things. And he could understand and explain and, and agreed why they should get out of the European Union was to stop all this damn migration which took away housing, took away social services, and took away opportunities. And my response to him was very simple. If the British political system had chosen to deal with those issues in the way that the Germans have dealt with those issues, that is to say, pay for the goddamn health service, pay for education, pay for training, pay for hospitals, pay for housing, they wouldn't have had the problems that they're facing. But they chose not to. And there's not a damn thing that suggests to me that any future British government is going to invest in education, health, or housing in a way that they haven't done 20 years ago. Which is why I was arguing to him that I thought Brexit was an absolute contrary. But that, I think, you know, very long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> to deal with migration, it is, again, a whole-of-government approach. And it does demand sacrifice and contribution from people putting hands in pockets and governments willing to make tough choices. But we've seen, and again, knocking on wood, sorry, um, you know, Angela Merkel has, seems to have managed to do that in Germany thus far. Challenges, certainly. Threats, obviously. But nonetheless, she has done much more with many more than the UK has. And, you know, don't even get us started on how little the Irish government has done. Yeah, another back there. Um, yeah, the, on Irish neutrality again, sorry. Um, and thanks for a great talk, Professor. Uh, the, is, there, is there not an argument to be made that, uh, you know, we could, we could increase our defence expenditure by a significant factor and still add no capacity to European and, and NATO capacity and that our greater, our greater additions value added are, come from things like our United Nations uh, seat at the UN or seat at the United Nations uh, Security Council where we, as a neutral, a perceived neutral state that we're able to influence uh, political arguments, advance European norms and also just, to, just to, to defend European interests in a, 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 amongst nation states that wouldn't talk to the Germans, or wouldn't talk to the Brits, or wouldn't talk to the French because of their imperial past, for example. Is, is that an argument that you find compelling at all? I find it an argument. <laughs> um, but they seem to be willing to talk to Norwegians with no difficulty. I mean, who set up the Oslo process? Why is it called the Oslo process? That's not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a researcher here at the Institute. I'd be, more, uh, be interested to hear more on what you said about PESCO. Um, specifically, what do you think has been the main barrier for member states of the European Union to take advantage of that mechanism? Has it just been a sort of, if you will, over-reliance on NATO, or is there something else to the sort of formality of it all that has been, if you will, scaring off member states? And so you mentioned that there were member states interested in engaging in, in permanent structured cooperation. Uh, do you think that is the way forward for developing a more meaningful European defence capacity? Or do you see any danger in the sort of potential fragmentation that's going to the, the problem with PESCO is the member states couldn't find a use for it. Because for the member states looking at PESCO, this was supposed to be an advanced guard, intense cooperation in the area of security and defence, doing things that other states couldn't or wouldn't do. The response from the member states was, yes, we should have that kind of group, but we should all participate. Which invalidates the whole notion of having an advanced subset, because if everybody's in, there's no rationale to PESCO. So what they've been struggling with, really, is to identify what specifically PESCO can do, that while it is open and voluntary to anybody to join, provides actual added value. Now, allegedly, and I haven't, I haven't read the implementation report that Mugarini published, I think, the day before yesterday on the, on the security defense uh, implementation plan, 
you know, allegedly they have a framework, they've identified a way in which PESCO becomes, in a way, modular. So that within PESCO, and I'm just picking stuff out of the air now, so don't call me, but within PESCO you could, for example, design a new attack helicopter. And that a number of member states would come together with PESCO and would agree to have, let's say, 50 of these super advanced, high-tech advanced uh, attack helicopters, and they'd share the development costs, they'd all buy it together, they'd all train together, they'd all train together, and that if you know, an EU battle group needed to go someplace, they would all guarantee that they would all take their helicopters and go together. So you have that deepened level of integration and cooperation above and beyond anything you'd have outside. But you do that in different areas with different pots and different constellations of members. The problem with that is, or at least the argument is, we well, could do that now. You don't actually need PESCO to do the kind of thing I've just described. But, and I think here you get into the politics of it. Here you get into Mogherini looking for some big wins, you know, identifying an opportunity, seeing high level of member state ambitions, and being able to sell a concept as a means of fulfilling that heightened set of ambition. So I think there's, there's much more politics in it than there is in terms of what PESCO can actually do. Does it lead to fragmentation? Well, yes. Um, but I think in the area of security and defense, you're never facing that because, you know, again, and we have to remember this, you know, when you're talking about security and defense, this is, this is the ne plus ultra of any sovereign state. Defending its citizens and defending its borders is the the core central capacity of the Westphalian state. To ask any sovereign state to begin to share that with other states is a big ask. So I think you're talking fragmentation, but there has to be fragmentation. And I guess what Margarini has to hope for is that adding up all the individual parts creates a much bigger kind of, of collective momentum. Um, I was just wondering, why you would think regarding NATO. So let's say if in 2020, Trump loses re-election and you get someone who's a more standard, stable US president, stable, coherent, mm -hmm. do you think other member states of NATO at that point can overlook a four-year span as just something strange that happened and everything is kind of back to what it was now we can trust in Article 5? Or is it sort of a core threat that's perhaps shaken <coughs> NATO to a point where even if you have that in 2020, it's still a question mark as to if it's really a valid alliance? That's a really good question. Um, I have two very contradictory responses. <laughs> On the one hand, I would never underestimate the potential politicians just to forget and to pretend it never happened. That was a nasty blip. There was a lunatic in the White House for four years. Normal service has been resumed. I would not underestimate that capacity. On the other hand, you'd have to, if you were a forward-thinking enough kind of politician, <laughs> say, well, if the American political system, with all of its alleged checks and balances and you know, the amazing insights of founding fathers, could deliver that kind of lunatic into the White House, it might do so again. Um, and what's worse, it might, it might deliver a lunatic who actually could rashly put together a program. But as long as there's a circus master there, as opposed to an actual lion there, I think you know, we can survive and live through it. But if, if, as I say, if the political system can do that once, why can't it do it a second time? So that genuinely has to make a forward-thinking politician think, well, how solid is this alliance anyway? And remember, you know, when you look at NATO, and, and we think of NATO, you know, and here I get into my post-structuralist critical security kind of vibe here. You know, if you read Article 5, it's not a lot. You know, there's, no, there's no great ringing declarations and promises in the show. It just says, you know, if one member <laughs> is attacked, paraphrasing slightly, you know, other members shall come to its aid and assistance by whichever means they, whichever means they deem most whatever. I mean, it's pretty wishy-washy in terms of text. What has given NATO and Article 5 serious heft is the fact that A, you have an organization behind it, an integrated military command, you have had US troops in Europe, and you have had US presidents since 1949 who have restated again and again and again that Article 5 matters. And now you have a president who wouldn't say that. And that has to be cause for concern. Yeah, right here. <clears throat> Thanks very much. Um, so I've got kind of two points I'd like to ask your opinion on in a sort of general way. Uh, they're slightly different. The first one is about something that wasn't mentioned today, which is sort of soft power in a way through capital flows. So. A lot of Chinese investment in Europe, for example, Hinkley Point, for example, uh, property. 
Russian investment, etc. Um, how that affects uh, these dynamics, um, and also around, for example, the Arctic as a source of energy. So you're looking at those Baltic states, and they are launching pads for the Arctic. You're looking at that part of the world being under more intense focus now. So how energy flows and capital flows, and, sorry, capital flows and energy dynamics, how that affects all of this, and that's a bit of a broad question. The second one is around populism, I guess. The power of people to put a message into a large amount of people's heads and for them to act on that, a la Brexit, a la these other populist um, dynamics again coming through. Part of the European uh, decision-making um, mechanisms, I guess, is, is that perception of people in a room somewhere in Strasbourg or wherever making decisions, but you know, the, it, it's kind of like the adolescent is growing up saying they want to make their own decisions now. And with all of these abilities of everybody to come together and uh, affect policy in a way that just wasn't possible before, um, is there a way that needs to be changed in decision making? You know, kind of a broad question. How do we how do we go about dealing with that? Because there's only so long you can say, block that person. There's only so long, so long you can try and mute that. Yeah. You know, th there are people I know who are dealing with um, counterviolent extremism at a, at a at, you know they go online and they literally try and let's just get, stop this for young people who are getting radicalised. Is that the way forward? So those two th those two okay. points I'd like to your opinion. Okay, I didn't I wasn't taking notes, but I remember the first question because I remember snow and money. Um, <laughs> And energy. Uh, 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 yeah, sorry, snow, money, and energy. Um, not my area, obviously, um, but there are people who do a lot of work on this, um, and particularly with respect to the, the, the specific case with respect to China. You know, I mean, what, what I'm told by people who know China is to say that China has, and Chinese policymakers have their eyes on the long, far horizon. So in terms of an idea that the Chinese are going to sit in a room and pull the plug on the euro or pull the plug on the European finance capital, I don't think so, because they have, they have themselves invested in, therefore they want to benefit from, therefore their business is not in destabilizing. Um, but if you look at the other act, you look at Russia, and you talk about the Arctic, and you talk about energy, there you see a very different kind of scenario. Because we've already seen the Russians use energy as, as a power tool. We've already seen them close and open pipelines. We've, we've seen them use corruption in terms of getting pipelines and stopping pipelines. So that is clearly of the moment and, and of some immediacy. We also had in this house, uh, not too long ago, um, a colleague from, uh, from uh, the Norwegian military who was talking about the Arctic. Um, and talking about the Arctic in a very interesting way in as much as you know, dividing relations in terms of science and the environment, whether bilateral relations are very, very good and have continued regardless of political difficulty or, or contestation. But on the military side, you know, the, the Russians are back to what's called this bastion concept. Um, in which they are regularly, and we saw the papers today, you know, Russian jets are having to be escorted across Baltic airspace. Russian submarines are challenging um, uh, Norwegian, Norwegian waters and Swedish waters. The, the Norwegians are investing in, in eight new high-tech uh, submarine hunters. I mean, stuff you didn't even think you had to think about since, you know, Red October back in, back in whenever. So, well, I suppose my answer to the first question is it, it requires a very sophisticated response, a very multi-level response, one that is targeted. You can't simply say that and say, well, everything is threatening and everything is dangerous and we just pull down the shutters. You have to go out and find the opportunities when you can get them. As with China and the environment, you know, maybe you do bracket human rights while you deal with China on the environment, maybe you have to. And maybe that's why Margarini's paper has been, has been criticized for, for promoting that kind of very variegated, heterogeneous response to security threats and challenges. Um, and the second question, just give me a word of reminder. It was around the populism. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to, to my undergraduate students, I, I always love to describe the European Union as, as the bastard child of democracy and diplomacy. The European Union is neither one thing nor another. It's not a full on state, it's not a federal state, not a con federal state, where you can have very standard federal kind of decision making with a European president and a European cabinet responsible to a European parliament directly elected by European people. Net clear, everyone knows that model. We can't do it. Why? Because the union is also a community of states. So states are represented and diplomacy is one of the main, re main ways why and how decisions are taken. And diplomacy does not like sunlight. Diplomacy is about women and men in small rooms making deals and doing deals outside of the political firmament and trying to bring in technocrats and address problems without engaging in political passions. The problem with that is it then turns around to European publics and say, well, this is the consensus, this is the agreement, there is no alternative. We are where we are. 
you know, yes, you, you know, we have euro austerity to support the euro, and there can be no change from that. There can be no challenge to that. And if you do challenge that, you will end up like Greece. Now, that is a lesson for somebody who hasn't, as I said earlier, got a vested interest in the system, who hasn't got a nice room in the, you know, the global cosmopolitan liberal household, says, well, screw it, let's blow the house up and start again. So I think there's a fundamental challenge to politics in the European Union context, and the European Union has got to move from the diplomatic more to the democratic. But then that raises the ancient question of the F word. And I don't know that anybody is ready to revisit the F word of European federalism. But that is what a democratic Europe would look like. We have this bastard child because it, it worked to this point. It's not working now to some extent, and we do need to rethink and rejig and relook at how that works. Um, and political parties domestically have to take their share of responsibility. Because if a minister goes off repeatedly to Brussels, and when she comes back, says nothing but, oh, they made me do it, they made me do it, they made me do it, I have no response, but they made me do it, well, who the hell are you going to blame? But again, you begin to look at the psychology of individual politicians, and that's not a pretty picture, <laughs> not a pretty picture either. Hello. And hi, I work at the Institute. So just clarifying that point, do you think federalism is the only way no. to enhance European democracy? No. Because obviously the Spitzen candidate process in the last European election Allegedly. was a big attempt towards that. Allegedly. Allegedly. Do you Allegedly. think that resonated on the street? No, but that's my question yeah. around this. Do you think that looking towards 2019, that would be a way to enhance European democracy? And if not, what ways do you think we can do that work? Well, I wrote a book. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I co-wrote a pamphlet. <laughs> when, I was, when I was in Trinity College, um, it was called Trinity Blue Papers. It was the first Trinity Blue Paper I ever written on an electoral model for electing a European president. Mm -hmm. And it had an electoral college, and because I was working with people you know, who knew all the electoral systems and blah, blah, blah. And it's very detailed, and John Bruton actually commissioned us to write it, because at the time we had the presidency, and he, this was one of his big ideas, was a direct elected president. I mean, I think you need to do something of that scale if you really want to break the prison. If you really want to make people look at the European Union in a different and fresh light, you would have an election of a European president amongst 450 million Europeans. Um, short of that big bang, which you know, you've never heard, I mean, uh, Bobby McDonough wrote a very famous book on the, on the negotiating the Amsterdam Treaty and said one of the, the, one of the things you never hear in European negotiations is a big bang. You know, it just doesn't, it, it's all small iterative steps. So in the spirit of small iterative steps, one of the things I think the European Union has got to do is to break this austerity stranglehold. Between the European Central Bank, between the Commission, and between the member states, you know, they have got to come to an agreement that there has this one size fits all, unless it's offset by some degree of fiscal federalism, you know, this thing in the long run isn't that sustainable, or is only sustainable on the back of what is happening to, to, to Greece at the moment. And you can't blame technocrats for that. That's not Brussels bureaucrats selling and insisting on austerity. <coughs> That's German chancellors, Finnish prime ministers, Dutch finance ministers, you know, those are the people who've got, their, who've got their foot on the neck of European austerity because for their domestic publics, they don't want to see their money wash itself. We, if, if, if solidarity means anything, we have to revisit and reclaim and recapture what European solidarity means. And it does have to involve some cash. Yeah, just on your interesting point, like your electoral college blue paper, uh, sorry, I'm John Kenyon, I'm a paper counselor, uh, I'm a reference to you as well. How do you foresee the difficulty of your being still affecting a place where you have you know, neighboring countries voting for a Latin-style candidate, for example, or you have a Baltic-style candidate? But that, that takes over, that, that actually preempts everything else. You've got to read the book. It's a very complicated electoral system, but it's awfully <laughs> good. Um, no, because obviously those are those, because what you're going to find is you're going to find big state candidates. Because you know, if you're a German candidate, you know, you're going to have that many votes in the Electoral College possibly locked up. But you know, there are ways in which an electoral college can be designed to try and offset those effects. Um, you, can, you can weight things in different ways. There are lots of, lots of clever, clever things you can do. But, but the bottom line is, yes, you're going to have, if you want this sort of big bang approach that John Bruton was advocating at the time, you're going to have to have a system that galvanizes people's attention, that says, you have got four choices for president. You've got a green radical who's fighting for her agenda on climate. You've got, you know, a Muslim socialist from France who's fighting on his agenda, and you've got some rock-ribbed Bavarian, you know, running on their agenda, but you've got a visible choice. 
And yes, it might be mostly large state countries, but they're going to be divided in terms of politics too. You're not going to get German Social Democrats voting for a Bavarian CSU candidate. And then you begin to develop the kind of sense of, you know, we're Europeans, but we're left-wing Europeans, we're green Europeans, we're right-wing Europeans, that the way the European Parliament is organized is supposed, to, is supposed to foster. But you've got to develop that amongst people who think they actually have a political choice. If they don't have political choices, they're going to be pissed off. We had a speaker at the Institute recently who suggested an idea of taking the UK's outgoing seats in the Parliament and creating Europe-wide lists at MEP level. Do you think that kind of step is just too small if you're talking about galvanizing? Oh, I hope I don't like the person who said that. Um, no, I don't, because I think that, that, di that, that diminishes the contact between the citizen and, and the parliamentarian even more. Right. You know, I know, you know Israel has a, a, a single list system. I think maybe the Netherlands has a single list system. You know, the only people who run those lists are the political parties. I mean, the one saving grace of, of, of our system and the German system and others is at least you have a link you know, that is my member of parliament, and if I'm pissed off, I'm going to knock on her door and complain about things. Now, we all know that members of the European Parliament, second order elections, people don't actually do that, but that at least, there is that link. And I think with Europe-wide lists, it just, that all evaporates. And suddenly, you know, these are, you know, another 50, another 75 European cosmopolitans yeah. that some people voted for that nobody knew who they, who's they are. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, I am curious about two of the actors you referenced in your presentation. At first, Angela Merkel, you know, she's been given due credit for her more humanitarian response to the refugee crisis, and she has been described in certain quarters as the, as the new leader of the free world. I've described her as such. Uh, okay, but at the, same, at the same time, you also referenced in your presentation the sort of fetishization of austerity, and there's been no more substantial figurehead of that trend in Europe than Angela Merkel. And, you know, in, in a sense, just because it, it didn't lead to such a, a, a such a surge, people might have worried about in populism in Germany it, or, or in illiberalism. It certainly did in other countries. You referenced Greece several yep. times. The other actor I'm curious about, with whom we may have a contradictory relationship, is NATO. So uh, you also referenced that even you know, NATO people wondered if it was post Cold War relic and had reached a level of obsolescence, and now uh, and look where we are now. I wonder, did NATO to some extent create its new relevance by its outward expansion in, in, in Eastern Europe? Short answer to the last question, no. Short answer to the last question, no. Um, NATO's enlargement was flat at the start, understood, acknowledged, and accomplished. Um, multiple concessions were made to Russian sensibilities or, or outgoing Soviet, incoming Russian sensibilities in terms of stationing the troops, in terms of the whole, the whole agenda. Um, I think, I mean, knowing only that much about Russian foreign policy and Russian politics, I think Russians are always going to be hyper, hypersensitive about that question of encirclement and what that entails and what that, and what that, uh, what that might involve. And that goes back centuries. That's not, that's not, a, that's not a new phenomenon. Um, but, you know, Russia had opportunities, multiple opportunities in terms of the NATO-Russia framework, in terms of the NATO-Russia partnership, in terms of partnership for peace where all of this stuff could have, could have worked. What I think happened that went badly was what happened in respect of Libya. Because what happened in respect of Libya, what also to a lesser extent happened with respect to Kosovo, is that Russia was sort of, was sort of in the councils, but not of the councils. And decisions were made which presented the Russian government with fait accompli. And for multiple reasons that have more to do with Putin's personality, domestic Russian politics, the instability of the Russian state, the notion of a strong leader, I mean, all of that comes together in the constellation where NATO is now the most convenient hobby horse to which I can beat around the head to generate domestic political blah, blah, blah. So, no, I don't think NATO made its bed, and I don't think the EU made its bed, and I think, and I think those are wrong analyses for all kinds of different reasons. I'm sorry, I'm bringing back to the first question, which is Angela Merkel and, and, and fetishization of, of, of austerity. Um, again, I'm, I'm wary, I mean, I call her the free world, so I'm guilty of this myself, you know, excessive personalization. You know, that austerity politic, you know, isn't just German. It is Finnish and Dutch and etc. So they're, you know, the so-called northern creditor countries, they're all in this together. And Germany, by reason of its size and its weight and its, its responsibility, was in the lead of that camp. The problem, to my mind, was that she wasn't effectively offset. She wasn't offset by an effective and credible French leader. 
That is what Hollande was elected to do as a French socialist. And I don't know why, but it just didn't work. So you didn't have the constellation of forces to balance out the, you know, the famous Franco-German engine. Um, and I don't think that the austerity politics is that ingrained in, in, in Merkel. I think it's much more about Schäuble. I think it's much more about the CSU. I think it's much more about a certain tranche of conservative Germans that span the CDU, CSU, and often to now into the, into the AFD. So I think if you get Merkel, or if you get Macron and Merkel with an effective relationship, if you get Macron with a kind of, of political wind he has behind him, and I come back to the metaphor, I think you have a window. And I don't think, nothing that I have seen of what Angela Merkel has been quoted as saying, has ruled out anything that Macron has put on the table as of yet. Now, there are certain things Macron has not yet put on the table that might be in his back pocket, but I think that is part, part of a journey that they're both on. I just think the journey has to speed up a little bit. And before we go, I do want to ask you to settle one bet that we have around the office. Please. In one word, is Jeremy Corbyn a threat to Western civilization? No. Thank you. <laughs>